And you're live now. I'm live now. Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Aisha Kamara. I want to welcome you on to our really, really short panel today. Um, I'm just going to um, say a couple of things. Um, at, the at the beginning, uh, the demand for a global freedom of movement is certainly not new. When we talk about the subject, other political and social demands, for example, the abolition of borders, the so-called city for everyone come into play, and also the question, in what world do we want to live in? We live in turbulent times. 2020 has not only been a tough one because of the short-term effects of COVID-19, but also because of the ongoing long-time pandemic called racism. So I think the organizers of this conference were right when they said we need to talk about utopias, we need to think positive, um, we need to talk about what needs to be done rather than talking about what harms us. So I am very glad to moderate this panel today, which was supposed to start 30 minutes ago. Oh, no, even an hour ago. So um, I would like for us to try to get into this utopia thinking. Um, I have um, here four panelists that are on different domains when it comes to the global freedom of movement. They work on a global level, on a local level. So I would love uh, to start off this, this conversation with each and every one of you presenting yourself, introducing yourself, and then tell us what your utopia for 2048 would look like. Um, Betty and Jane from Women in Exile, welcome to our panel. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So please tell us a little bit about you and then tell us also about uh, the utopia um, you would like to see in 2048. Hello everyone. Let me put this. You have to put on your. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. My name is Jane Wangare, and um, I'm from Kenya, and I'm an activist uh, in a, an active in a group of refugee women by the name Women in Exile. And maybe I give a small introduction of our group. And yeah, um, uh, it's a refugee women group founded in the year 2002 by refugee women in Berlin, in Bladenburg, uh, who were living in the lagers. And so they, they saw the conditions were not favorable for them and their children. And so they mobilized and sentenced others to come together and started fighting for their rights. And um, from there, we have been fighting, and our main campaign have been to abolish all the lagers uh, for women and children to accommodate them with dignity because we found we don't have like um, privacy, hygiene, and so many other things. And um, maybe I give Betty to introduce herself, and then I can give my utopia. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Betty Gary, <laughs> and I'm also from Women in Exile. And like Jen says, we fight for uh, rights for women and children. Uh, and our main um, refugee women, and we are fighting also for the lights to stay, lights to come, and light to to go. And also, like uh, against deportations, um, like about uh, health to be uh, for everybody that we have um, health care for, especially for refugees as well. And um, so we can say we want, like our utopia is uh, freedom of movement of like to go be going and coming or going anywhere in the whole in the gro whole globe yeah in the whole world not just 
uh, that the borders are closed to some people and open to everybody else apart from us. So this is why uh, we fight against these um, uh, things of uh, these discriminative uh, ways of life for people who are more privileged than others and also uh, being looked upon because we are coming from countries which are supposed to be uh, poor countries as we are called but we know we are coming from rich countries that uh, we don't have um, freedom to move or we have to be selected a few of us can move while the rest of the community of the uh, people cannot move so this is why uh, we say we want the light to go light to come and light to stay and this is our vision for 2048 and beyond to have equal rights and equal opportunities thank you Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to Charles, because I see your picture right close to Betty and Jane. So, yes, please um, introduce yourself briefly and then tell us about your utopia. You're muted, Charles. You have to unmute. Apologies. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Aisha. Um, I'm Charles. I'm a co-founder of uh, the Fo Forensic Oceanography Project based in London, um, through which we've been developing methods to document the violations of migrants' rights at sea over the last nearly 10 years, actually, now. Um, and the work that we do, the reports that we produce, um, serve as the basis for litigation against different forms of border violence. But at the same time, we've also been involved in um, setting up the, the extraordinary system uh, of the Watch the Med alarm phone, um, where activists across Europe and uh, North Africa and beyond, in fact, support migrants at sea on a day-to-day -day basis uh, since 2014. And this, uh, this project, which is really extraordinary and uh, one of the key actors in the Mediterranean right now, um, has supported simply thousands of boats in distress um, over, over the last years and, and really sees itself as, if you will, a, an activist infrastructure to support migrants' freedom of movement in, uh, in the present. So in terms of my um, utopia, I, I think I would start precisely uh, from, from there. In a sense, I think that we, we consider freedom of movement, not as a utopia in a sense, right? Freedom of movement, in a way, we, we consider that it is being enacted. It is being seized by migrants who cross borders on a day-to-day -day basis, despite the denial of the right um, to do so. And so freedom of movement already exists, but of course, in a deeply constrained um, way. Um, freedom of movement in that sense is really a practice that migrants already seize and that we can try to support um, and expand. And of course, we would like to see, um, as Betty and Jane were, were arguing, uh, rights instituted, a right to international mobility for all, right? Um, that is, you know, of course, absolutely uh, crucial. And we share as well uh, the, the urgency of the the right not only to move, but the right not to be displaced by uh, wars, by uh, extractive policies, etc., and uh, the right to stay, as you as you mentioned, uh, Betty. I think, but I think what's really important for me to underline as well is the way we we consider that um, really an emancipatory politics of freedom of movement cannot be restricted to simply opening borders, but needs to be. Uh, articulated with the global justice movement, with anti-racist movements, uh, with a, a range of uh, entangled struggles, because all of these dimensions of oppression and struggle actually um, shape the trajectories of migrants today. Thank you. 
Charles, we will talk about, uh, I already see a little difference between um, the perspectives, so I'm glad to, 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 to talk about that later on, but uh, I would like to invite Katarina as well. Welcome to the panel. Glad to have you here. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself and letting us in? Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming together. Um, I am, my name is Katarina Moravec and I am an uh, artist and also participant of several social movements in Zurich, in Switzerland. And um, I am going to talk a little bit about the project that we did here in the city that is about uh, citizenship for everyone who is an inhabitant of the city of Zurich. So it's about urban citizenship or the solidarity city. How it, how this uh, aimed uh, mostly in the discussions around around citizenship um, because freedom of movement is one thing and it ex exists and it is claimed and it is done every day but if you don't have any rights um, you are not able to make a good life for yourself in a sustainable way I mean the the question of rights is always connected to the the place uh, where you choose to live so. Um, the access to social and political and um, cultural rights is not more equally distributed in Europe and I would say all over the world. Is the access to rights distributed in a very unequal way. Um, but this unequal distri distribution of rights becomes more and more visible. For example, if you look at um, the number of inhabitants of Switzerland who have with citizenship, um, who don't have a Swiss citizenship but who live in, in Switzerland since years and decades and they are you know speaking a Swiss dialect and and everything um, this amount is growing you know the people who are inhabitants but not um, don't have citizenship rights so there's a, a gap that is opening up and that is more and more creating demand and 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 very, very visible um, demands for another concept of citizenship that is not based on blood and soil, but that is based on more the question of where do we choose to live in this world. Um, and the term of urban citizenship, so citizenship connected to a, a certain place where you live, a certain city, um, stands for an extension of those legal, political, social and cultural participation to include all inhabitants and not only those who have the classical passport or the citizenship. Um, so it, also, it is also about, Switzerland is very proud of its democracy, it always says that it's one of the oldest democracies in the world, but uh, unluckily uh, women are only allowed to vote in Switzerland since the 1990s, so you, the question is if this is really such a great democracy. <laughs> where 25% of, of the inhabitants are not even allowed to participate in the, in the, in the, in the votes or, or uh, to in certain political, um, to, are not able to use their political rights. Um, and we have been working on a project in Zurich in Switzerland for a number of years now that aims to create an urban citizenship for Zurich. So a city card that, um, that, in, uh, that uh, ensures the access to social and um, mostly social and citizenship rights for everyone who lives in Zurich. And this um, has started out as an art project. So it was uh, like more of utopia in the beginning and everybody said yeah, the artists, they have some ideas, but we are never going to be able to realize this project. And now um, six years later, we are now at the point of implementing it into the local governmental policies. So it has grown from an art project more or less into a project of the municipality, uh, not without any conflict, but still my, I would you also, this is my like a little bit the perspective of my input that, that we should, there's evidence that communal forms of organizing and uh, sustainable connections between social movements and governments, uh, they work out and they can really make a difference and then it, it's somehow worth trying out. Um, and this model, this project has 
become a sort of blueprint now in Swiss politics of how to democratize democracy, yeah, a democracy that is not really democratic for everyone, um, how to do this within a new post-migrant Swiss society. And um, so my vision is not only to emancipate ourselves and our struggles, but to emancipate our imagination, what we think is possible. So always think a little bit bigger than um, and to try the impossible. Because there's evidence that the solid, a solidarity coalition between social movements and municipal politics can create pathways to realities that we are always told that they are impossible. So let's be realistic and try those impossible roads. Thank, Thank you. you. You already have uh, hope. Okay, good. Um, did you hear me? Okay, good. So, Alassane, um, the last one in our circle. Um, J'aimerais bien que uh, vous, nous parlerons, vous nous parlons un peu de votre utopie de 2048. Et uh, j'aimerais aussi que, parce que ici en Allemagne, ou en Europe, on entend beaucoup parler de la, de la migration. Et, et j'aimerais bien savoir comment la migration, comment ce thème est discuté euh, au Mali, ou plutôt en Afrique de l'Ouest. Aussi historiquement que j'ai déjà euh, lu quelques interviews où vous parlez euh, euh, de la migration circulatoire. Et voilà, euh, euh, j'aimerais bien que vous nous parlez un peu sur ce sujet. Alors, je disais que on peut pas, je peux présenter une, euh, dans un premier temps euh, le, schéma, le schéma de migration globalement en Afrique et particulièrement dans, en Afrique de l'Ouest. On pourra parler du Mali ou du Sénégal, de la Guinée, du Burkina, mais de façon fondamentale, euh, nous avons euh, ce schéma qui prend corps même dans notre espace de vie sociodynamique. Vous savez que nous sommes issus des peuples anciens qui ont euh, existé depuis les, les, les années 1000. Hein. On, on, nous parlons de l'Empire de, du Mali. Et, et ce n'est pas des choses utopiques, c'est des choses qui ont existé. Une existence complémentaire de tous les peuples qui, qui sont dans ce bassin ouest africain. Et, la complémentarité euh, du côté, euh, que ce soit du côté du Sahel, entre les différentes populations euh, nomades, sédentaires, agriculteurs, éleveurs, et le lien, euh, le lien transsaharien avec, euh, euh, les, les, avec les, 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 les territoires du Maghreb. Donc, euh, je peux dire que jusqu'aux années, dans les années de colonisation, euh, Jusqu'aux années 60, 70 encore, les, 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 les migrants, on peut dire, pour bien se comprendre, les migrants effectuaient ce qu'on appelle des navetanes. On, on effectuait des migrations circulaires, des migrations saisonnières. Les gens partaient après les saisons de pluie pour aller chercher, euh, pour faire un peu plus de, de, de moyens et revenir. Ça peut s'étaler sur trois mois, six, six mois entre le Mali, le Sénégal, la Mauritanie, l'Algérie, jusqu'en Libye à partir des années 70, avec la sécheresse. Euh, les gens ont commencé à beaucoup plus rester dans les pays du Maghreb. C'est dû essentiellement parce que les années 70, il y avait beaucoup de sécheresse dans le Sahel, que ce soit au Mali, au Niger, au Burkina. C'est des pays qui ont traversé tout, euh, toute une, une dizaine d'années de sécheresse de, 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 de 70 aux années 40. Donc, ça a permis un peu à des migrants depuis 20-30 ans qui faisaient les migrations circulaires pour aller en Britannie ou en Libye, commencer à installer dans ces pays maghrébins euh, pour prendre plus de temps et pour faire plus de ressources. Et, et de ce fait-là, jusqu'aux années 80, nous tombons un peu dans ce qu'on appelle le programme d'ajustement structurel qui a effectivement déstabilisé tous les services publics dans nos États, comme on le sait, qui a déstabilisé tous les services publics, qui a mis encore une autre vague de, de migration sur les routes, c'est-à-dire 
des fonctionnaires qui ont, qui ont quitté leur travail, au, au regard des privatisations des usines et aussi des fermetures de beaucoup d'écoles, au regard de l'affaiblissement des systèmes de santé. Donc, ça a aussi désagrégé un peu, n'est-ce pas, les, les, les dynamiques socio-économiques. Beaucoup de gens ont perdu leur travail, beaucoup d'usines ont fermé dans les années 90 avec le programme d'ajustement structurel. Donc, ça a mis encore sur les routes beaucoup de gens qui partent encore à ajouter au premier lot qui était déjà installé au Maghreb. Vous savez que euh, euh, ce qui va venir ensuite, c'est à partir des années 90 à 2000, euh, il y a toute une politique, euh, toute une série de politiques de contrôle des migrations qui va commencer à se mettre en place. D'abord, entre euh, la France, qui est notre pays de destination euh, par excellence, entre la France et nos pays africains, qui vont d'abord fermer les, les regroupements familiales, ils vont fermer les groupements familiales, ils vont ensuite euh, durcir les conditions d'obtention de, de cadres de séjour. Euh, je, dis, je dis ce côté-là parce que les gens qui bougent, qui vont, qui reviennent, même avec la France, les Maliens, les Sénégalais, les Guinéens, qui faisaient la migration circulaire, même avec la France, l'Espagne et l'Italie. Jusqu'aux années 80 encore, on faisait la migration circulaire, que ce soit avec le Maghreb ou avec l'Europe. Mais il se trouve que les changements de politique, la, la prise en compte des migrants comme étant des facteurs de menace, a entraîné les deux choses. D'abord, un durcissement même des, des, des entrées et sorties entre les pays africains et, et les métropoles, en France par exemple, où il y a eu des restrictions sur le les regroupements familiaux, il y a eu des restrictions sur les 10 ans de présence pour avoir la carte de séjour, il y a eu les lois d'Ebré et tout ça. Donc, et du côté du Maghreb, c'est les mêmes euh, euh, pays européens qui ont euh, exporté euh, leur contrôle des, des frontières euh, au Maghreb. Donc, ça a beaucoup impacté sur nos migrants africains qui étaient déjà installés là-bas, qui faisaient des migrations circulaires ou qui restaient en permanence là-bas. Ils n'avaient pas de problème dans le temps, on peut dire ça comme ça. Mm -hmm. euh, les, pre les, premiers drames, les premiers drames des migrations euh, contemporaines de ces 20 dernières années connues, c'est le CETA et Melia. Et ça, c'est en 2005. Avant 2005, il n'y a jamais eu de bateau ou de pirogue qui est cassé en mer. Jamais. Avant 2005, CETA et Melia, il n'y a jamais eu de de groupes de migrants qui prennent les bateaux. Pourquoi ils prennent les bateaux Parce qu'on explique les problématiques, on les analyse, mais euh, on, on, on oublie de se demander mais pourquoi ce facteur arrive. Donc, euh, je sais plutôt de ressortir un peu euh, les dynamiques qui ont, qui ont amené les migrants à se trouver vulnérabilisés. Que ce soit en Europe, que ce soit au Maghreb, c'est essentiellement dû, d'une part, euh, aux choix politiques qui ont été mis en place euh, dans nos pays africains dans les années 60-70, parce qu'ils ont préféré développer les, les, les grandes villes et ils ont laissé les, les arrières, les périphéries, ils ont laissé les, 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 villes, les autres villes du pays dans, le, dans un certain marasme. Donc, euh, les populations de ces, de ces périphéries, d'abord, ils ont tenté l'exode rural pour venir chercher du travail en ville. Mais avec le programme d'ajustement structurel, il y a du travail en ville. Donc, euh, tous les valides qui quittent les villages pour venir en exode en ville, ne trouvant pas de, de poche d'insertion en ville, ils ont augmenté sur leur chemin, comme on peut dire. Donc, euh, c'est ce qui a amené à augmenter encore. Donc, et le programme d'ajustement structurel, avant ça, les sécheresses des années 70 à 80, qui ont balayé tous les bétails et de, du Sahel, ça a été une catastrophe environnementale. Moi, je pense que avant même qu'il y ait les, les programmes d'ajustement structurel, doivent être interpellés au niveau de la justice internationale. Parce que les programmes d'ajustement structurel sont venus à un moment où, depuis une dizaine d'années, la plupart des pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest traversaient ces grands chécheresses là euh, Une grande partie de nos bétails sont morts. Vous savez qu'une grande partie de nos populations sont agricoles et pastorales. Donc, euh, c'est des ressources de plus de trois cinquièmes des populations 
qui ont eu les ressources euh, perdues. Et donc, forcément, ça va augmenter sur les flux. Et aujourd'hui, euh, aujourd euh, nous avons, enfin, aujourd'hui, avec la maladie, mais avant la maladie, il y a déjà tous ces systèmes respectifs qui sont là, qui nous empêchent nous-mêmes en Afrique de circuler entre nous. Parce que, mm -hmm. euh, je le dis simplement, les politiques européennes de gestion des frontières, ils sont arrivés d'abord au Maghreb, et du Maghreb, ils ont poussé plus au sud. Aujourd'hui, ils sont dans nos pays. Ils sont à, le mur de l'Union européenne est à Gadez, le mur de l'Union européenne est à Gao, le mur de l'Union européenne est à, est à Nuro du Sahel, le mur de l'Union européenne est à, à, à Taoua, par exemple. Donc, c'est toute une transversale de, de, de cause à effet que, d'abord, en Afrique, nous subissons, mais plus encore qui est qui est porté par les, par les migrants. Aujourd'hui, est-ce que tous les systèmes de contrôle aux frontières qui sont installés dans le Sahel, entre le Sahel et le Sahara, tous ces dispositifs militaires, sont-ils là pour lutter contre les, les migrations ou pour lutter contre les groupes terroristes mmh. euh, vous, avez, mmh. euh, vous avez plus de 15 000 à 20 000 soldats euh, des forces étrangères qui sont disséminés dans le Sahel. Euh, ça n'empêche pas les attaques, les attaques continuent, mm -hmm. euh, les violences euh, s'accentuent de plus en plus, euh, les, 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 les vols de bétail, les coupures de route, les, les conflits communautaires, tout s'aggrave, mais pendant ce temps, les, les, les forces étrangères continuent à se renforcer, mais on remarque, surtout du côté du G5 Sahel, que les fuseaux sont plutôt dirigés sur les voies migratoires. Mm -hmm. Donc, est-ce que l'Europe craint, l'Europe craint-il que les, les terroristes partent en Europe ou alors ils craint-il que les migrants partent en Europe Parce que mm -hmm. les militaires mm -hmm. sont là, nous ne voyons pas le bout de leur travail. Mm -hmm. Nous voyons un peu les, les résultats qui est que il y a des blocages de circulation. Aujourd'hui, pour quitter, pour quitter le Sénégal, pour aller au Burkina, vous allez faire 4-5 jours, quoi. Et vous allez faire peut-être une trentaine de barrages. Parce qu'il mmh. y a cette dimension politique de décourager les gens même de se déplacer. Mmh. Nous sommes. Merci. Une communauté. Alors, ça, je, je, il, faut, il, faut, euh, il faudra que. Euh, voilà, il faudra que on regarde un peu le temps. Euh, mmh. malheureusement, malheureusement, il ne nous reste pas beaucoup de temps. Euh, je peux expliquer un peu mon utopie. Oui, voilà. Je vais expliquer un peu mon utopie. Ah, merci. merci. <rire> oui, justement, moi, c'est plutôt l'utopie là qui m'intéressait. Je pense que depuis trois ou quatre ans, j'avais fait même euh, une déclaration comme ça au Bundestag et qui a été un peu repris par quelques députés qui ont bien aimé. En fait, nous parlons à Mali ici, nous parlons de la valorisation. Nous parlons de la valorisation euh, des, des, des capacités des migrants. C'est-à-dire que les migrants, euh, aujourd'hui, c'est une menace pour les Européens, peut-être, peut-être pas tous pour le gouvernement. Mais il se trouve que c'est un apport très, 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 très important en termes de développement. Mais ça s'explique comment Et Ça ne s'explique pas seulement par les transferts d'argent ici. Ça s'explique par le fait que en Europe même ou dans le monde, partout aux États-Unis, où les migrations sont importantes, Toutefois que les migrants ne sont pas pris en compte dans la société, il y a du défaut. D'abord, c'est un opérateur économique. Quelqu'un qui est sans papier, il n'est il est, il est, il est, il est pas, pas, pas en capacité d'apporter quelque chose, même là où il est. Aujourd'hui, avec euh, le, la maladie Covid et toutes les mesures qui se posent, est-ce qu'il ne serait pas bon de réfléchir, pas seulement pour ouvrir les frontières, mais pour, pour prendre en compte ceux qui sont déjà sur les fronts euh, migratoires au Maghreb, euh, en Grèce et autres, parce que c'est là le problème. Comment désengorger ces lieux-là D'abord, notre utopie, c'est surtout que, par exemple, dans le Sahara ou sur les routes migratoires, il y a beaucoup de personnes, ils constituent des populations des villes. Il faut construire des villes. Il faut, le, il faut leur construire des villes écologiques, des villes qui respectent, parce qu'aujourd'hui, comme on dit dans le monde 2.0, on doit reprendre à réfléchir. Mais ça ne viendrait pas des hommes politiques. Ça va peut-être venir euh, euh, d'une inclusion des forces vives 
dans le lieu euh, d'essayer de donner un autre plaidoyer. C'est-à-dire que les migrants, qu'on qu leur donne les moyens de vivre où ils sont. Et ceux qui doivent partir, qu'on leur donne des moyens de ne pas partir, pas pour les bloquer. Parce qu'il faut annuler le blocage et le transformer en renforcement des capacités. Les migrants qui vont en Europe, quand ils reviennent, euh, par exemple, quand un migrant veut aller en France ou en Allemagne, c'est bon de faire un visa de deux ans ou trois ans dans lequel il va, il travaille, il a une formation et au bout de ce nombre d'années, il revient. La migration choisie peut être euh, bien, bien gouvernée si les pays s'entendent très bien. Mais le problème, c'est les stocks migratoires qui sont dans les zones comme au Maghreb, comme en Italie, comme à Calais. C'est ça la grande problématique. Je pense que les utopies doivent se construire autour de rendre ces personnes-là. Il y a une dame qui a dit ça tout à l'heure dans son parler. Il faut rendre les migrants citoyens de là où ils sont. Il faut les rendre la citoyenneté de là où ils résident. Voilà, oui. c'est ce que je peux dire. Merci. Merci. Uh, thank you so much. I will. You can turn on your cameras back on. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this. Uh, for at least taking, you know, the time to hear each other's utopias. Um, I think our time is almost up. I don't know uh, how the translation uh, of um, what Alasan. Uh, how Alassane's translation, uh, if you all heard what he said. Um, I want to uh, maybe close the conversation by uh, asking Betty and Jane, um, since uh, your work is also focused based in Germany, um, um, and we haven't, yes, how would your perspective be on this matter, um, Alassane, talked about um you know the 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 circ circular uh, circular movements um that migrants migrants especially in west africa did in the past um he also talked about uh, how how his utopia would look like um when it comes to visa application um What other things uh, would need to be done, especially if you look at the German context, um, for example, when it comes to residence obligation, um, which is also a really important topic. Um, so what would you have to add to this? Um... You're muted. You have to. Uh, okay. Hello. Hello, Sally. Um, thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, I can't translate it <laughs> because it was a lot. Yeah. So maybe let's just talk about. Um, Let's just talk about, you know, the condition of women and young girls, refugee women, young girls in Germany. Um, what would be like, what would you ask for on a political level? Like, what's the first action um, that needs to be taken? And also, what is your opinion on the residence obligation? Um, actually, for for me, um, I will say, and I, I think uh, my utopia will be like a, a call of humanity. Um, and if I say this, I mean, uh, like when we come to the women and girls in uh, Deutschland, uh, most of them. I think they are the double victims uh, of all this. And uh, uh, concerning to what you had translated uh, before of what Alassane Al 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 said, uh, when we say like uh, application of the visas and everything, it's very hard and it's very... Uh, um, 
it's very closed and um, I think it's done purposely for the control of the numbers which are entering uh, into Europe and um, and to me I think uh, the 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 rights are there but to implement them is the problem that is the like the global uh, human rights and I think movement is one of them but uh, to implement them uh, this is the problem and to us we are calling always on um, on the on the implementation of everything of every law which is written even when we come to the citizenship the laws are there very clearly. There are those who come to seek like um, political or humanitarian uh, refugees, but they are not granted because to prove to the authorities that uh, this is the case, it's very difficult. But the law, the, the law is there. It's really well written in the Constitution. But to implement it is very difficult. And this is where... Um, um, and I think somewhere he talked uh, of democracy and Deutschland, uh, like I said, I, I always say I thought Deutschland is a democratic country, but uh, I can't see the democracy itself because it's not implemented. And uh, for us, we call for the implementation of the written laws, already the written laws which are written and the um, the the implementation of the of the democracy itself and maybe betty you can add something <laughs> but um i'm sorry <laughs> i didn't hear also what he, uh Alassane said but uh when I, it comes to what i what i heard from jane about girls and women. uh women i think they are victims and they are not only victims here in German, they are victims from all the way they come through. And I think it's time borders are opened and those people who want to travel uh, travel because um, for it's very difficult that uh, people have to go through all these um, uh, difficult ways of getting to Europe or to other uh, countries where they want to uh, to stay and uh, like where they can live a better life or where they can get uh, like a uh, good stay. But all these borders closing and choosing who can move from one place to another because of visas, which are only like, uh, yeah, for the, for a part of the society who can afford to, who has money or whatever. But this is what I think Jane is talking about when she talks, of, she talks about humanity because I think we should not be discriminated because we are, some people are better than others because they have money or because they are coming from other, some countries. So I think uh, the best way is to open borders and let those who want to, to go, uh, to move, move because even when people get here and they are living in these conditions of being uh, isolated outside, then they are going through a lot of uh, stress and they are also uh, being, they are not happy. I mean, they, they are not even able to live in a, in a way like they are in this country. They are living even some of them are worse than they used to live in, a, in their own countries. And uh, yeah, and we are doing, people are moving to better their lives, to have a better life for themselves and their families, not because they want to, to move, but because also of the, of the, of this situation of the whole global policies of having some rich countries looking down or taking from the poor countries. Mm. So I think this is all, a lot need to be done Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty and Jane. And thank you, everyone. Also, Katarina, Charles, and Alassane. 
and, and actually aisha um we have some women and girls who come like especially in Deutschland, and they find it very hard for them and they want to leave and the moment they say now we are tired and they have not yet uh they they didn't get yet they are stay they want to move instead of moving freely first they are kept in de detention even for six to one year before they are taken back or deported back to where they want to be and um this is like also a blockage of movement when they come and they see this is not what we thought of and now we want to leave it's very difficult especially here in Dutchland if I volunteer to go back freely and without their pleasure I have to be kept into detention and uh, and I think in future we don't want such things yes I really I really I'm really sorry um, it's getting interested it's getting really interesting and I you've made some really important points Betty and Jane but they are already telling us that we have to stop our conversation now. We are kind of getting kicked out of the stream. Um, I don't even know what to say because, uh, yes, thank you so much for still, you know, bearing with us, uh, do, even with these uh, very difficult circumstances. I don't know. I would have to get back to the organizers to maybe find a different a different date for us to maybe come together and have and repeat this conversation because I really, really think it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm sad that I couldn't uh, really hear each and every point. And Katarina says, yes. So let's just uh, try to say goodbye for now. And thank you, Aisha, for all the work that you put into this. And it's the beginning of a conversation. Yeah. yeah thanks thank so you. much. Yeah. <laughs> And everybody else is on the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Great to meet you, Betty, Jane, Azasan, Katerina, to see you again. And uh, our struggles continue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs>